Hey everybody, welcome to the Journey Church online ministry. Uh, Today is really going to be exciting. We're in the second message of a series we're doing called The Ugly Truth. And today, a friend of mine, uh, Charlie Brown, that's his name, no kidding. He's a great guy. He's been pastoring for way over 40 years. He's, he's a good friend of ours, and now he's become part of the Journey Church here in Chesapeake, Virginia. He's going to be talking about um, why you can't do you. Hey, listen, to get the best out of this experience, to get the most out of this online experience, you're going to need to download the JC app. Now, you'll see a QR code come up. I want you to download the JC app, and from there, you'll be able to get all kinds of connection with us. You can get notes for today's message. You can see previous messages. You, you can connect with us. You can give to the Journey Church. So download the JC app. It's a great tool for you to use as you experience our online ministry. I'm praying you'll be blessed. So now I want you to meet my friend, Chuck. Hey, I'm Charlie Brown, and I'm part of the Journey Church, and I'm very excited to be doing this second part in a series called The Ugly Truth. Let me share with you my story. My introduction to faith came in the context of the Jesus Revolution. Now, I was not a hippie or anything like that, but the the Jesus Revolution that started in California swept all across the nation. And it came to a small junior college campus where I was attending school. A young group of Christian students uh, met me. They began to share the good news of Jesus Christ with me. And they began telling me all about uh, the love of God and how I was a sinner and how I could be forgiven of my sin and how I could go to heaven and spend all of eternity with God. And that was the good news. And that was great news. I found that very interesting. But to be quite honest with you, um, what really hooked me on this faith thing was the fact that if I entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ and I discovered the truth that all of a sudden my life would take on an immediate sense of purpose and significance and that was very significant in my life. That's what sold me on the need to have this faith. I grew up in uh, somewhat of a broken home. I was pretty much a survivor. My whole uh, uh, goal for life was to be able to uh, graduate from high school and to um, uh, get a job. And as long as I could pay my bills at the end of every month, then life was a success. There was nothing in that story that talked about significance or changing the world or serving in a leader in our world. So the gospel message for me was all about God transforming me to be somebody that I had never been before and what a tremendous impact He could have through me in this world and to help bring a significant change to the world. Now needless to say, my introduction to faith was just a bit overwhelming because I didn't grow up in church at all. I knew nothing about God or Jesus or the Bible or Holy Spirit or church traditions or baptism or communion. All of those were totally foreign to me, totally foreign. And so I had to learn everything everything about faith. And it was just, it was a real struggle for me. Uh, I want to share this one story with you because it's a little bit embarrassing, but if you're where I was, if you're a bit ignorant about faith and you're interested in faith, but you're going, I don't even know enough about faith to to know what questions to ask. I don't know where to begin. Let me share with this, share this embarrassing story with you. I was While I was not very well educated about faith, I was very passionate. I did understand what it meant to become an apprentice follower of Jesus Christ and how to do that. And so I wanted to tell everyone about my experience. I was sharing this with a young lady on campus. She was standing in an office where she was working and I was telling her my story. And a young lady was standing behind her and she looked at me and she asked this question. She said, do you or do your church, does your church believe in the Holy Ghost? Now, I I was just stopped in my tracks because in my ignorance, I had never heard the word ghost in the context of faith. And so I wanted to get it right. So I ran out of the office, ran across campus, went to my, uh, the director of the Baptist Student Ministries, who is my collegiate minister, Ron Wells. And I said to Ron, I said, Ron, do we believe in the Holy Ghost? And he looked at me like I was some kind of a ding dong. He said, yeah, you moron. He said, it's a synonym for Holy Spirit. And I said, well, Ron, I don't know. This is, I'm new to this and I've never heard the word ghost. I just wanted to make sure I get it right. So I'm sorry. But then I turned and I ran across campus, ran back into the office and said to that girl, yeah, we believe in the Holy Ghost. Now I know. 
you may be in that position where you say, you're saying, I have a lot of questions about faith. I have a real interest in faith, but no one has ever taught me. And so I hope that we will uh, encourage you and, and tweak your curiosity to where you will begin to ask, ask questions about faith. At the very foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ, who said, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I am the life. We live in a postmodern culture that does not accept the truth of God. So here's my question for you, and I want you to ponder this. What is your foundation for truth? Where do you find truth for you and for all of our society? How do you determine what's right and wrong? What is your definition of good and evil? Where does it come from? So we're going to take a break, and I want you to, to think about that, ponder it, discuss it with someone at lunch or in a small group in your journey group, wherever you are, and then we'll come back after a, in a few moments, and we'll continue this message on the ugly truth today. In the beginning, God made us in His image. We did not create ourselves. We did not create our DNA. We did not create our brains. God created us, and He created us in His image. You can't do you. You cannot create yourself. You cannot create your own truth. You cannot create a system of what is right and wrong or good or evil. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome, and in that letter to the church in Rome, he said, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Don't do you the way you do you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Personal sin is when we make personal superiority our core value. Within all of us, there is an attitude of superiority. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, or, and, and, and worst of all, whether we recognize it or not, <clears throat> we have a tendency to feel superior to other people. And frequently, we want to be superior to other people. We don't want to make the worst grades in the class. We don't want to lose at the Super Bowl. We want to be the winner, the most successful, the most likely to succeed. We want to be the very best, or at least seen as the very best. I think at its very core of racism is superiority. <clears throat> it's the idea that, that I'm better than someone else. And it's easiest for this to pop up in our lives uh, in the context of racism. Think about it. If you see another person and they're a different color than you, they speak a different language or a different uh, dialect, or they, have, they come from a different culture, or their worldview is different, they're simply different from you, don't you have a tendency to look at that person and think, you know, I'm sorry about them, I'm better than that. White is better than black, black is better than brown, brown is better than whatever. <clears throat> it is a natural tendency for us to look at people that are different from us and think that we are superior. This whole attitude of racism, it, 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 it manifests itself in other areas as well. If you're a Democrat, you think you're superior to Republicans. If you're a Republican, you're superior to Democrats. Everyone feels superior to someone somehow. And that is at the very root and the very core of this personal sin because it's when I'm superior, guess what? I get to decide what's best, what's right, and what's wrong. When we sin, which is a biblical concept, sin means we miss the mark. We shoot for the, for the bullseye and we miss. Now, when we look at other people, we say, well, they obviously missed the mark. Look at that lifestyle. Look at what they're doing. What an absolute failure. But I want to tell you that, that, that this to miss the mark is a perfect illustration of sin because I know there are some, quote, good people in the world who work incredibly hard to be good and yet they miss the mark. We all miss the mark. We all have personal sin. We all struggle with this issue of superiority. Personal truth in our society has created an absolute revolution. There's a revolution of sex, politics, family values, and morals in general, general in which we define everything based upon our selfish self-centeredness. We talk about truth in terms of what I want for me, what's best for me. If personal truth is okay for one person, personal truth is okay for everyone. And I don't think we want to go there. 
Let me share with you a story, a true story. In 1955, a young man named Emmett Till, a young African-American man, 14 years old, went to spend a summer in Mississippi. Uh, he was at a store, and when he was at a store, he saw this white woman, and the story is that he whistled at this white woman. Uh, his friends immediately grabbed him and, and rushed him back to the home where he was staying, and they told him that under no circumstances should he ever do that. It was a very dangerous thing to do. Within the next day or two, two men showed up at that house late at night, and they took Emmett from that home. They beat him. They tortured him. They shot him. They tied him to a cotton gin fan, and they threw his body in the river, and it came up three days later. In the minds of those white men and most of the people in that community, killing a black person, a black kid, for whistling at a white woman was perfectly okay. It was their personal truth. Now, when I tell you that story, you would immediately say, that's wrong, and it is wrong. But here's the problem. You and I have personal truth, and we create our own truth, and we come to conclusions that are also wrong, but we have a hard time recognizing it. God is the absolute truth, and He is the truth by which we measure all things. That's where we need to get. We need to get to that point where we're reading and understanding and comprehending who God is and what His truth is for us and how do we, how do we put that in practice in our, in our own lives. God created us in His image, but not just in His image. He created us with a set of idealistic expectations. He wants us to live like Him. He wants us to look like His Son and to be an apprentice follower of His Son. Acts 17, 28 says, For in Him, in Him we live, and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, a great verse says, You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the One who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has taken us. He's transformed us. He's changed us. He's called us. And His high expectation of us is that we would follow Him in, in, the, in the footsteps of His truth and live according to His, His goodness and His perfect nature. That's our calling and that's our challenge. Martin Luther, who discovered the truth of God, who discovered sin and the solution to sin, which was justification in Jesus Christ, said this. He said, our nature is so deeply curved in on itself that it wickedly and curvedly and viciously seeks to use all things, even God, for its own sake. Attitudes of personal sin or superiority show up in Christians. I know, I can tell you my own story. Sometimes when I leave church and I'm driving home, I see people out in the community and I ask the question, why aren't you in church? Why weren't you in worship with us? What's wrong with you people? And in that moment, I recognize my attitude towards them is an attitude of superiority, even though I'm taking a Christian approach. So, another question for you to ponder. Where do you find yourself trying to be superior to other people? When are you imposing your truth on others? Or when are you taking your truth and saying to yourself, it's okay, I'm okay, because it's my truth and I have justified it. I want you to think about that. Take some time, ask that question, and look deep within your soul for the answers to that question. So how can you be the you that God made you to be? How can you find that person and be the, uh, the most real person that God intended for you? How can you find the real truth and how do you implement that? Well, first of all, I think we have to come to a position where we are humble. You know, when, when uh, Paul talks about Jesus in the book of Philippians, the letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi, he talked about who Jesus was and Jesus is absolutely superior, but he didn't take that position. 
Instead, it says he humbled himself. He lowered himself. He became a servant for all people. And so you and I have to be willing to stand before God and humble ourselves and admit that we are not equal to God. We're certainly not superior to God, and we are not superior to the rest of this world. We need to be willing to humble ourselves and say, I, there are some things I need to learn from God. And there are some things I need to change in my own life in order to be in perfect alignment with who God is. Secondly, we need to declare that, that we have this, this uh, parasite that is within us. It's called sin, but it's like a parasite. It eats away at us. It's living within us, and it's out to absolutely destroy us. And so we need to confess that that sin or this parasite exists in our lives. The word confess in Scripture means literally to agree with. And so we need to get to a point in our lives where we're looking at ourselves, looking in the mirror, but on, in, the, in the same picture with that mirror, there is God and His truth. And I need to agree with what God says about me. I need to agree with what God says, this is the way I'm calling you to live. This is what really is right and wrong. This is appropriate and best for society and culture. And I need to agree with God and not try to convince God that what I'm doing is okay and talk to myself into saying it's okay because God's a God of grace after all. We need to ask God for a clean heart and a renewed attitude, a whole new mind. Dallas Willard talks about this being the transformation of our heart. And we need God's truth and God's spirit to step into our lives and to completely cleanse our minds and remap and re redirect our minds to begin to think exactly the way God has called us to think. Now, I love a, uh, a theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about what it means to be an apprentice follower uh, of Jesus Christ, and he talks a lot about the grace of God. We love to talk about the grace of God, but it because ba basically what we say is, when I make a mistake, God is a God of grace, and God will forgive me. And so we basically we give ourselves permission to, to make mistakes and to lower the standard that God has for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. We create a, a renewed vision of grace within ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's baptism without church discipline. It's communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate, made in, 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 into our own lives so that we are walking and living the same way Jesus Christ lived and we walk according to His standards. We walk according to His truth. Listen, I tell you this out of love. You can't do you because God made you. And you need to get to that point where you ask God, and so what does it look like to be made in your image? What does it look like to live in your image? We did not create ourselves. You can't do you. I can't do me. We need to turn in repentance and humility and say, God, here I am. Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? The answer to those questions are going to be exciting. So here this, here's my final question for you. Where are you finding truth? Are you finding it in yourself? Are you finding it in society or culture? Are you defining truth for yourself? Or are you finding truth in Jesus Christ? So I hope you ponder those questions. And if you have more questions, I hope you'll talk to pa Pastor Nate or some other folks in the Journey Church. They'll help you find the right answers to these questions. God bless you. Thanks for listening today. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Sing faithful.
I'm a restoration.